Hello and welcome. My name is Johnny. Thanks for joining me for another conversation about the creativity behind making interactive media and games. This is episode 179. And on this episode, we're talking about The Artful Escape. It's a musical adventure with some high-profile voice actors attached, Carl Weathers, Lena Hitty from Game of Thrones. Um, you know, it is basically what a concept album would look like if you could play through it. Uh, that is the idea behind it. It's formed uh, by a studio called Beethoven and Dinosaur, led by Johnny Galvatron, from a band you might remember from around the mid-2000s called the Galvatrons. Now, Johnny started uh, out learning computer animation, 3D modeling, uh, but became popular in music and went touring all around the world. So it kind of sidetracked this path that could have potentially led into games much, much earlier. Uh, Johnny's come back and has now made the artful escape. We had this conversation a little while ago. We had a chance to play the game a little bit early uh, and experience about what it is, the story they're trying to tell, um, some of the interesting visual ideas that they've got in there. It's very well written. It's very stylish. And we can't wait for you to learn a little bit more about it. Let's jump in. Australia's best video game podcast. Subscribe to Pixel Sift on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever podcasts are found. Johnny, thanks for joining us. Appreciate you coming on the show. Yes, it's metal to be here. I love your background. <laughs> Very exciting. Uh, crack of dawn uh, in uh, early morning recording. But um, look, people who haven't come across the Artful Escape, I remember we saw it at a Paxos uh, a couple of years ago. It was at a relatively small booth in the indie indie fray, but it had quite a crowd around it. Um, for people who uh, haven't come across it before, how would you describe what the game is? Well, it's kind of a narrative-driven action adventure platforming jamming uh close encounters of the third kind spaceship uh game um it's quite niche uh it's it's the game i'll describe is like imagine if david bowie went on a intergalactic journey and came back as ziggy stardust and so what came first because it is obviously such a musical story was it a the music inspired this game or did the idea of it come uh, first and then you kind of built the music around it um, I think the idea that came first was like exploring the satellite aspects of of artists' um, core mediums. So you know, you talk about David Bowie writes music, but it was elevated by his his stage persona, elevated by the way he dressed, the imagery he attached to his music, his album covers, all of these different things around a, around a core medium. And I've always kind of been into that. Um, I was in a band, and we were definitely obsessed with those things, like way more than the music, which you know. Uh, you shouldn't really do uh, when you're trying to contribute to the musical sphere. But that, that's kind of like what I was really into. And that, that was kind of the, the, the cornerstone of the game. One of the things I noticed is you're kind of playing with that perception of expectations weighing on you and that sort of idea of what people are with. And the thing that just came to mind as it was going through is everyone in, in the early stages of the game, you're talking to people around the town and it kind of really felt like that moment, you know, the Dylan goes electric moment or something like that. Dylan goes electric for sure. Yeah, you know, where people want you to be one way um, and, you know, you're, you're going off in a completely direction following your own creative thing. Was that a, a big sort of idea behind this sort of game? Um, I think, I don't know if I went in with that angle. I think you start to make the characters and then you start to realize they start to speak for themselves and, and those stories kind of write themselves over, over a period of time once you get the characters right. Obviously, this game's quite character driven. It's not, it's not a, it's more of a character piece than I guess a crazy kind of plot directed games, which I, I guess a lot of games are very plot heavy. Um, and, yeah, I think just that it just speaks to everyone. It's quite accessible that trying to step out from shadows, trying to live up to expectations. Um, and I think especially for musicians, they kind of feel that way because usually there's a few people telling you you're wasting your time. Um, uh, so I, I think that just kind of hits for most musicians. What inspired you to make the transition from making music into making games? What was the, the point that you thought, hey, I can probably give this a go and, and now have a game that's going to be coming out uh, very, very soon uh, on a bunch of different platforms? On a bunch, yes. It was very hard. Um, I was in a rock band. I had a record deal, um, toured the world for five years, mostly toured regional Australia, where briefly dipped out into the rest of the world. And um, I hated it. hated touring. Not my vibe. Didn't like the partying. You know, I like partying, but I, I'm not, you know, I just can't do it every night. And uh, we, um, I came back. I never wanted to leave the house again. 
and I wrote a novel uh, for like five years, showed it to no one. And then I just kind of saw, I got, I, I've been into gaming my whole life since the master system ages, you know, that dates me for sure. But, um, and I just saw, I saw an angle where I could come in and I saw a path that I could take to get into the industry and just kind of really dived into it and uh, managed to, to pull it off. I, 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 we did a Kickstarter. That was my first. I thought, oh, I'll just do a Kickstarter. Everyone gives you money. That's easy. And then um, didn't didn't get through on the Kickstarter because we, we didn't do very much prep for it. Honestly, we didn't build a community or anything. But um, really, it, the idea was just to get the game seen to try and pick up some kind of publishing. Um, do you know the company I Am 8-Bit that make cool video game stuff? They, the, Yeah, they saw us on Reddit, I think, and told Annapurna about us. Had a couple of calls. Uh, Nathan from Annapurna then rang me and said, are you going to be at PAX? And I was like, in three months? He's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, we've got a table for sure. I'll see you there. Uh, we didn't have a table. We didn't have a demo. We had nothing. We just had some concepts. Um, just basically what was on the Kickstarter. And so we went crazy for three months. Oh, I called in like my last favors uh, standing to get like one of the last tables at PAX. Um, and was still working at worked all the night before, um, had, when we got there, we had a little tiny screen and we saw that everyone had like, had these massive screens and like, like all these amazing setups. We just had like a tiny, we're like, oh my God, what are we doing? And uh, you know, we borrowed a TV off someone's dad because I was so broke. And, um, uh, and then I just went home and grabbed all my guitar gear and just threw it on the table because, you know, that'll work. And um, and Annapurna turned up uh, 11 a.m. the first day after we'd been up all night finishing the demo. And then they took me out for lunch the next day and victory. What are some of the things? I mean, it sounds like it was a very big learning journey as you were kind of going through there. But, you know, what are some of the things you came into this thinking, this bit's going to be easy? Uh, and it was way harder than you thought it was because that's sort of the, you know, the, the creative journey I'm always curious to hear about. Um, the ha- things that you have to learn are just like being a being a boss, never been a boss before, running an office, making sure it's clean, uh, stuff like that. Um, and just, you know, I, I guess the big learning curve for me was like learning how to, you know, individually work with the artists and, and, and try and make them – content in their workplace and happy with what they're working on and feel like that they were contributing to the project. Um, that was, um, a steep learning curve. Um, and I think we have a, like a really amazing workplace. I think, um, it's done it really well. Great team. Um, and they've what's, they're what's made the game amazing. Um, you can see the demo online, some places, which is me drawing and animating everything and, just doing uh, too much and uh, you can see when you get when you, you you get the real people in there you realize you're a, a shadow stumbling in the dark what where do you see your role as a, you know as a creative director cuz you know as a, you sort of mentioned bit office manager bit uh, you know admin what 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 sort of your day to day actually end up looking like when you were making this game um n- doing no admin and um uh, really not of doing any logistics whatsoever. I think, but you know, I do a few things on the game. Like I, I wrote the game, um, and directed the dialogue recordings and, um, co-wrote all them and recorded the music with Josh Abrahams, who I've worked with for many years and designed a lot of the levels. And I, I, I did a lot of stuff. And so I, that's one of the great things about being an indie game dev is just like one day you're, you're writing the next day you're doing materials or particles and the next day you're working with Carl Weathers. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. How did that come across? Cause you've got Jason Schwartzman, you've got Lena Headey on there. Uh, how did those uh, people get involved with the project? What was that like? Did you just have a list and go, we'll see who we can get, or did you pick them out and say, this is the people we want? I'll tell you how it happened from my side. So from my side, what happened was, I was doing a playthrough for Annapurna. It was one of the, you know, it was a big playthrough. There was like 20 people on the call or whatever. And I'm like, started to play the game and the music's not working, right? So there, something had happened where game-wide, most of the music had been broken. And you, you've played the game? Yeah, it's a pretty core cool part of the actual world. And music is a big part. 
Yeah. So what I did was like just really <laughs> lent into like acting all the voices <laughs> to just kind of fill the space. And then uh, after the call, I, I got a call back from Annapurna and they're like, oh, they're going to. I'm going to be in trouble, which I never am for Van but it's, you know, you feel like that. And they're like, we think the game should be voiced. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> so then we did a little test to see if we're working. Like, wow, that's really cool. Let's do it. And then Deb, who we work mainly with at, at Annapurna, um, she was like, who, you know, who do you want for Lightman? I was like, well, you know, who can I have? What are we, what are we talking here? She's like, can, if you could have anyone, who would you want? I'm like, Carl Weathers, number one. She's like, I'll get back to you. And then a couple of weeks later, Deb calls back and goes, Carl Weathers is in. And I'm like, sick. And then a couple of days later, he's in the studio and he's reading out my nonsense that I wrote. And it's completely surreal. And he's adding baby to every line and made it way better. <laughs> Put some meat on that bone. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> he was incredible. Uh, and like, you know, working with all these actors, is just like, you know, I, I am ashamed to admit that I, I love that stuff. I love like meeting Jason Schwartzman and stuff like that. I know you meant to like be like, whatever, but I, I I was wrapped up. I was so excited. Um, and like, you know, um, just, you know, I got to do just things that I'll remember forever. Like me and me and Lena Heaney, like doing impressions of each other in the studio and her just going, it's metal, it's fucking metal. Like, cause I say that all the time and, and like Jason Schwartzman came into the booth and he had like all these props that he'd bought in. Like he had a little synthesizer and a cape and like uh, an umbrella and a hat and shit. And he, he'd like do the takes like one way and then he'd pull the umbrella up and do it a different way. Like, oh man, what an experience. But you, obviously it was such uh, something you were there, but you know, did you ever feel that pressure of coming up against these people or do, do, is it their job basically to, you know, break the ice, be as comfortable and genial as possible? My first ever voice session was with Carl Weathers. And yes, that was extremely intimidating. Um, but not because I, I felt like, well, I did feel like he was going to yell at me. I'll be honest. He's scary. I, you know, I only know him from films. Um, and at the, end, the two things to say is I, I guess I was nervous because I didn't know the system of like how you talk to actors and, um, uh, and, you know, what you can ask them to do and what's the best way to kind of deal with actors and stuff. So I had a couple of meetings beforehand um, with the, the session director to try and to figure those things out. But halfway through, I felt like I had it. It's very much like talking to a singer in a, in a booth, which I've done a lot of, and which is just like kind of like, this is dope. I love it. Can you, can you add this bit? Can, maybe that would, let's try that. We've already got a good take, but we'll just try some different things. Very like keep the mood up, you know, and, uh, and, and just try and be suggestive as opposed to like telling people what to do was the vibe that I kind of got taught. And that seemed to work really well. And th- like all the people I work with are so professional. Like they're not there to give, they're there to give you what you want as an actor, you know, like, um, uh, Lena Hetty was like, came in, she did like 15 accents. She's like, which one do you want? I was like, oh, Royal British, please. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I think, you know, after I got past the first one, it wasn't too intimidating. And and I would just say that all the voice actors I work with are just incredible. Um, they're so, like, it's just a craft that I hadn't really experienced or got into before or seen how it works. And um, everyone was just uh, pleasure, pleasure to work with, absolutely. So no, there was no, no, uh, nothing scary. And if the sound had worked on that demo, you may not have been at this particular point. <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. I'd say their voice acting was a lot better than mine. Mine was, mine was drifting in all over the place, and most people sound like Dudley Moore. <laughs> you talked a little bit about the artistic style, and it was something that really captured me as I was playing the game. That's almost like picture book uh, layer design, but also almost like everyone, every character kind of feels a bit like a marionette. Can you tell me about how that sort of idea um, and that visual imagery kind of came about and some of the inspirations? Yeah, I think I've watched tons and tons of, uh, I tried to kind of collate tons of uh, tracking dolly shots in films. So there's like, you know, Spielberg does some really good ones. Obviously Wes Anderson's like you know, king of that sort of thing. Um, Kubrick does a few. The classics, not going in, not going into any real like obscure directors there, but, um, and yeah, you, you obviously the, these kind of tracking shots have this kind of parallax that you can you can represent pretty well in um, Unreal Engine, 
um, and Unreal Engine's pretty good out of the box. So someone who was uh, kind of naive like me could throw some things in there, like 2D images, because um, I had gone to university to uh, study 3D computer animation, but I got a record deal two weeks after I graduated and I never did it. So I forgot everything. So I was just like, I don't really know how to uh, sculpt, so I'll just draw everything and put it in. That'll work. Um, and then that's kind of the starting point of like marionettes and um, and that kind of parallax 2.5D vision of the game. And then as we developed the the look of things, you know, you start to like, what if we popped the what if you pop them out a little bit so they could catch the light a bit more? And we're like, well, we'll have to do that for everything. And they're like, well, all right, let's do it for everything. Um, and they, yeah, that, that was really, that was kind of where it came from. Films to me, just drawing pictures and putting them into 3D world and then developing it from that. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the team that you're working with, some of the artists that have kind of helped too? Because it sort of sounded like, you know, you started in the early stages sort of mocking it up and then you've had a team of people come along and, and help build it into the world that it is today. They all work at Beethoven and Dinosaur, most one in Queensland, the rest in Melbourne. Um, Arden Beckwith, who's our illustrator, um, just is, you know, she's the visual look of the game. Um, she illustrated, uh, the only thing she didn't illustrate were the things that were meant to look bad. And I illustrated them. Just want to clarify that. If you see anything rubbish in there, Put that's that on me. The record. Yep. And, um, Arden obviously like brought so much of herself into the game as well. Um, a truly like astonishing artist and, and she deserves all the credit for how beautiful the game looks. Um, and then we had um, uh, Tess Monash who did all of our animation and rigging and popped out all the character models um, and, you know, the that flamboyance of the rock and roll moves is all her. Um, and she designed, you know, some of the costumes as well. Um, definitely the the um, the the best uh, hairstyles, I would say, the most flamboyant for sure. Um, and we had um, Mikey McCusker, who's on three um, uh, uh, D modeling, and he, I think, just brought the game up another level again. Um, he's he's like a, just kind of looks like he works at two times speed. It's one of those people. It's quite bizarre. These things just appear in front of him. He's a magician. Uh, and then uh, Harry Truman, not the president, but uh, a young man who lives in uh, Brisbane. He um, uh, he did a lot of our kind of um, set dressing. And then it's just a wonder kid, just kind of like, you know, that, like he was fixing audio stuff by the end. You know what I mean? Like just all-rounders. Oh, everyone's all rounders. And then, you know, our programming team, Sean Slevin, Justin Backwell, um, Jack Noble, um, they, ha- I mean, the thing is you, people separate programmers and artists like they're, like they're different things. And I think it's mainly just because um, people struggle to understand the medium um, of coding. Uh, I do. It's, I, I find it unfathomable. Um, and yeah, really, I would include in in the artists. They did so much work on what makes this game fantastic, the way it moves, uh, the fact that it works at all. Um, uh, yeah, and then jo- me and Josh Abrahams and uh, Aidan Altman made the music. And obviously it's a big part of the game. It was, I spent way too much time in the studio and it was glorious. And I'm going to do it all again, damn it. Tell me a bit more about that process of, of writing the music and, um, you know, what was it? like for you how did it all work yeah well it's kind of like being able to play the guitar anywhere is a tricky conundrum like musically and um kind of in game technically um and what we did is kind of went with this uh, dark side of the rainbow angle you know dark side of the rainbow i'll explain dark side of the rainbow for for the, your viewers that don't know which is that you start pink floyd's dark side of the moon on the third raw of the MGM line, the start of the Wizard of Oz, and they're supposed to line up. But it, they don't really line up. It's just your brain kind of looking um, for, like, overrunning for pattern recognition between the audio and the visual. Um, and what we do is have kind of these amorphous, flowing, kind of um, quite cinematic, um, operatic pieces that flow through the music, and then you can shred anywhere. And if you get it all in the right key and you craft it well enough 
people will associate what they're hearing with the background music as so sometimes it will like perfectly flow with a counter melody that's playing or it will line up with a crescendo and you think yeah that was exactly how that was meant to go but really if it sounds good it's your brain so so you're not doing anything clever in there building pieces together programmatically it's kind of just thematically written together so yeah. they sit there nicely on top of each other yeah and we just use the primitive human brain to put it all together it's not a bad way to uh you know uh, smooth it all out isn't it yeah i mean there's you know other little things about you know what are you going to do when the guitar stops because unlike a synthesizer you can't fade it out you know it sounds unnatural so there's little tricks we did to have little notes playing at the end and then you find little magical things like oh if you put the harmonic like if you put a harmonic when the guitar ends you can play the guitar again and the first note will harmonize with the last note of what you played and you're like i didn't even mean to do that that's great um so yeah a lot of trial and error and um a lot of musical theory i guess when you look at the game, it kind of looks like it's a prog rock concept album, you know, really, yeah. you know, sort of, is that the way you were thinking about it when you were writing the, uh, the storyline and, and putting it all together? I, that's what I think about when I play music. Um, uh, that's, you know, when I close my eyes, and I'm playing, uh, uh, one of Josh's amazing synthesizers. That's me off. That's why, you know, I guess I think David Bowie said, it's just like, it's a weird way to try and communicate, you know, to an abstract medium. And I guess, you know, the cosmic extraordinary in that, that whole world, that's just, that's just me trying to um, show what I see, I guess, when I play music. Some of the things I'm curious to learn about is, you know, now we're at the end of this journey. People are going to be able to play it uh, very, very soon. It's terrifying. Um, <laughs> yeah, how does it feel at, at this very moment? At, at this very moment, it, it's weird. I mean, uh, we spoke about this before, but, I, I, you know, I'm in Melbourne. Um, we, f- we finished the game on Thursday. We went into snap lockdown on the Friday where we've been in lockdown this whole time. We're going to be locked down when the game comes out. So yeah, I just feel like I've, um, I've left the kettle on or something. I don't know what to do with myself. Now that the game's finished. I've been working on it. Yeah. Every day for years. And now I, I don't, I do have a child. I don't know if you can hear him crying in the background. He keeps me pretty busy, but, um, yeah, uh, I'm nervous that it's coming out. I'm glad it's finished. I don't need to do any more work on it. Like we're really happy. I can't believe that we made it every time I play it, you know, it's just, um, it's catch more wonderful things in the background that Harry and Mikey and Arden have done. Um, and yeah, man, it's a mixed bag. There's a lot going on. (laughs) <laughs> there is a lot going on. I think anyone who does anything creatively in the last like year and a bit has probably deserves a gold medal in some capacity because being able to finish things in this time is uh, is an achievement in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we were lucky. We were kind of already on the on the on the downhill. We knew what everything what the game was, and we were just filling things out, putting music in, rounding off the corners, as it were, and. Um, you know, I've heard some horror stories about people trying to develop stuff remotely. It sounds really difficult. Um, I'm just, you know, very happy to be working through the pandemic and still getting paid. I, you know, very, I mean, what, I'm in a massively privileged position as it is, you know, getting money to make video games and to be able to continue doing that. Yeah, what, very lucky. When people sit down to play the game, do you recommend they come into it completely fresh or do you want them to have a bit of a, a palette, a bit of a, you know, set up when they're coming into it, put themselves in the right frame of mind? Wow. That's, I should, you know, that's an amazing question. I think, I think it doesn't matter. I think you can go in there and be surprised by um, that kind of crazy psychedelic rock opera that it is. Or if you want to, if you want to go and listen to uh, some Steve Vai, and um and some van halen um and some rick wakeman you you might get maybe a little bit more out of the game as well um and if you took yourself back to the beginning of the project thinking about everything you've done so far what's one thing that you would do differently and what's the one thing that you're so proud that you did at the beginning that's really helped you uh make this project get all the way to the finish We, we got the music right first time for that demo that's the thing i would say that we did right and i can't believe that actually worked um worked on paper you know but was you know we didn't have any time to for a second chance on that first demo so we got that music right um next time i would just be like more prototyping more design more more knowledge of where everything was going instead of kind of trying to do it on the fly uh i think that's the usual story of first time game developers you think you know what you're doing and then 
you got a lot to learn. I mean, I did. I didn't go in thinking I knew everything. I I, I went in thinking this is going to be very difficult, and it was. <laughs> um, what's next for Beethoven and Dinosaur? We're going to do it all again. We're going to make another one. Not another Artful Escape, but or maybe it will be. I don't know. We haven't locked it in yet. Probably not. <laughs> get the band back together. Get back on tour. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to go on tour. That's what we're gonna... <laughs> That'd be pretty cool, actually. A, a touring game dev company. Completely impossible in, in this current situation, but like, not an not a bad idea. Yeah, that is kind of cool. I I read somewhere that a one video game development company like rented out a whole like tropical resort and just moved everyone there. Do you know that story? Oh, how do you get a job there? Yeah, I know. Let's look into it. I think they interviewed the guy and they're like, why are you doing this? And he's like, because I'm bad with money. So, And then I think they shut down not long after. I'm not sure. Sounds sounds great, though. Sounds like a good documentary. Sounds like a great idea. Look, it's been a real pleasure. I'm really excited um, that uh, people will get a chance to play it. It's quite an experience as well. And I think um, when people get a chance to, to look at it, they're really going to enjoy it. Johnny Galvatron, thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on the show. It's been metal. That's Johnny Galvatron from... Melbourne's Beethoven and Dinosaur. The game is out on the 9th of September. Uh, it's available on Xbox, on the Game Pass. Uh, it's also available on Steam as well if you want to play it on PC. Pixel Sift is produced by Fiona Bartholomeus, Nicholas Kennedy, Daniel Ang, Sarah Ireland, Viv Thumb, Adam Christou, and Nicholas Kennedy. Mitchell Lowe is our senior producer, and my name is Gianni Giovanni. I'm the executive producer. As always, we'll be putting links to everything we talked about in the show notes of our website. That's pixelsift.com.au. And you can give us a follow on all the social media accounts. Just search for Pixel Sift, P-I-X-E-L-S-I-F-T, Pixel Sift on social media. While I've got you, and this is the first time we're talking about it, very excited for something we've been working over the last couple of months. Normally... We would be in Melbourne, in Melbourne International Games Week in the beginning of October, bringing you a bunch of really interesting independent games, uh, games and stories from all around the country. But of course, we can't go um, because border restrictions and the pandemic means it isn't a possibility. That doesn't mean we're not going to be bringing you some of the best new and interesting games that have come out, including uh, stories and conversations with creators like Massive Monster, who we've had on the show before. We talk about their brand new game, Cult of the Lamb, Broken Roads, uh, which is the post-apocalyptic uh, RPG set in Western Australia by uh, team Drop Bear Bites. We'll learn a bit more about reimagining the classic, almost 50-year-old game, 50-year-old game this year, Oregon Trail, with the team of Gameloft, and many, many more. It's all happening on the 2nd of October. It's called The Sifter showcase we're going to have five hours plus of content of really interesting stories we're going to show off gameplay of games uh, that haven't been played uh, before on live stream including heavenly bodies which is coming out on uh, a little bit later uh, by two point interactive we'll be showing off gameplay for wrestle dunk sports which we've spoken about before on the show playing that with the developers as well and just really talking about some of those great creative stories that have been coming out normally they'd have their time in the sun as part of games week and we're doing our little bit to give them a little bit more light so that's what we're doing it's called the sifter showcase it's on the 2nd of october you can go to sifter.games and it will take you to the right place sifter.games october 2nd 12 o'clock until 5 o'clock-ish on that day, Australian Eastern Standard Time. If you share the show, it's the number one free thing you can do to support us. Word of mouth is really important to independent media like we are, um, and we'd love the opportunity to get your stories uh, and the game development stories to as many people as possible because there's really great, cool, creative talent that's happening all around this country and around the world. And we want to do our bit to share those stories about what it is actually like to make media. We can play them in a store. We can see that there. But can we pull back the curtain a little bit to show you what it takes to make these creative stories that we love? So that is pixelsift.com.au. Tell your mates, tell them to get on the podcast players, wherever they'd like to find us. Um, let them know if they'll enjoy it. We'd really appreciate you helping us share the word. That's all for this episode. Until next time, have fun. <laughs>